You've always talked about how you can really make an impact on the world when you can touch a billion people's lives or make a billion people's lives better. The chance to reach that many people now with something powerful is insane. I celebrate those entrepreneurs like yourself, like Elon Musk, that are willing to like just bet it all over and over and over again. Every company is going to be very difficult. Do we keep on having the passion for it? But we have to do that over and over again. There's very, very few stories that are just purely up and to the right. There's many ways to make the world a better place. You can do it by being a teacher, a preacher, you can be a lawyer, you can change rules and laws to make the world different, but you can be an entrepreneur. It's a really incredible way. Everything is gonna be hard. Since it's gonna be hard, may as well do something bigger. Yeah. Welcome to Moonshots. I'm about to sit down with Bill Gross, truly one of the most extraordinary moonshot entrepreneurs on the planet. When I think of individuals who keep up with folks like Elon Musk, Bill is right there. He's built over 150 companies, 50 of which have gone public or been acquired. He's had over 5,000 ideas over and over again. He's putting his ideas forward, building them, and creating extraordinary entrepreneurial ventures. We're going to talk about the 10 lessons he's learned over 50 years of being an entrepreneur that, for me, is pure gold. So let's tune in to Bill Gross the 10 ideas that help you become a moonshot entrepreneur. Bill, it is so amazing to be back here at Idea Lab. It's great to have you here. I had such a blast, literally, for the years that I was here working with you. And uh, uh, again, I just introduced you, but thank you for the work you do. Oh, thank, thank you. Yeah. You've inspired me a lot. Yeah, well, and, and you, me. I mean, we both have the same mission, which is to have entrepreneurs take on the world's biggest problems. Now, I like to say the world's biggest problem is the world's biggest business opportunities, right? And if anything, giving on this, on this podcast today, uh, I'm excited to share your, you know, your tricks on doing big things, taking moonshots, uh, how to finance those companies, how to, you know, to give them the highest probability of success. So again, the numbers just blow me away, 175 startups. And how many acquisitions or, or IPOs? We've had 50. 50. That's incredible. I mean, those odds beat across the board uh, what we're seeing in every aspect of the, the entrepreneurial world. Um, you know, uh, I'm going to get into uh, a little bit more of your moonshots in a minute because I want to hear about what you're most excited about. But you and I have kept a secret for 20 24 years now <laughs> of our first moonshot that we did together. And, and I want to tell a the world about it. A literal moonshot. A literal moonshot. <laughs> and I want to tell the world about this. Uh, and I want to see if your remembrance of it is the same as mine. So um, I think the story begins with you first on where the idea came from. So why don't you tell that part of the story? Well, ever since seeing humans land on the moon, I was fascinated with that. It had a big impact on my life. It made many people inspired about How math and science. How old were you on 1969? I was 11 years old. Okay, and I was nine, so yeah. eight, nine, yeah. And my brother was eight. Yeah. And Larry and I really, really dreamed of going into space, but of getting back to the moon, of owning something from space, anything related to space. And I remember actually when eBay launched, I was really excited to go find a moon rock. And I started looking to search if there was a moon rock available, but you can't own a moon rock. But I, we found out there was an auction where you could buy a patch, a patch of someone who had landed on the moon who had some moon dust in it. <laughs> and that was so exciting to even have anything that had been to the moon and back. Did you buy I, it? And I did get that. <laughs> and, Do you remember and, how much it cost you back then? I don't remember. It was, it was at an auction at Sotheby's in New York, and Larry went there for me. And it was really, really incredible. But the idea of getting back to the moon was so exciting and we're right in the backyard of JPL, mm -hmm. and the internet was taking off, and the idea of having sponsors and advertising and allowing people to control with a joystick, the educational possibilities of getting a new generation of kids excited about the moon was too compelling to not follow through on. So just to set the timing here, this is 1999. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, this is the peak of the dot-com insanity. <laughs> and, and the idea of doing something mechanical when everything else was internet only was yeah. very, very enticing. And I'm a mechanical engineer from Caltech yeah. and my brother from Caltech as well really thought we could do something like that. And then meeting you, we really thought we can pull this off. So my end of the story now is I got a call from your brother, Larry. 
And I remember exactly where I was. And it's like, you know, hi, Peter, uh, Larry Gross here. Um, my brother and I want to recruit you to be CEO of one of our companies. Now, I had not heard of Idealab at that point. I'd heard oh, of wow. Idealab companies. But, you know, some quick searching uh, got me like, okay, 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 what? Really? <laughs> so the call said, we want to do a private mission to the moon. I remember flying out to meet Larry in person, meet you, meet Marsha. And my memory of that was pulling up to the front here, what, 130 West Union Street, pulling up to the front door uh, in December 1999. And I remember seeing Porsches and Lamborghinis and Mercedes double parked too, too wide, right? It's like literally, it was like cars, like these expensive cars all up and down the street. And I remember walking in the front door and everyone was running. <laughs> everyone was running. We had a whirl of activity. It was such high energy, right? At this dot com, like just pinnacle. It was like running, running, running. We were at the center. Oh my God, you were at the center. I mean, at that point, uh, you know, name some of the companies that you had oh, we, going we on. We had Cars Direct. We had eToys.com. Go to. We had Go to that went public. We had City Search that went public. We had merged with Ticketmaster. We were just, it was really crazy times. It, really, really exciting. But it was like people couldn't walk to the restroom. You had to <laughs> run there to, to save those microseconds and go work on your business. And and so we sat down and you're like, um, I was running the X Prize Foundation and Zero G at the time. I remember that. Uh, X Prize in 1999, we had not raised the 10 million yet, and Zero G had not flown its missions yet. We were going through our STC process. They would both uh, happen you know, about four years later. And you made me a job offer. Now, I had never had a job before. <laughs> you know, I was always, as an entrepreneur, doing my own things, but it was like, how, can you, how do you turn down? And so I remember you said, listen, we have a fully funded mission to the moon. Because you had just raised a billion dollars in cash, which was a lot of money back then. I mean, we throw a billion dollars around like it's nothing today. And I think you had said, okay, we're going to allocate $60 million to do a private moon mission. And I remember your pitch to me was, we're going to do this privately. We're going to land on the moon and we're going to send back the signal and people are going to pay for advertising and pay for rights and we'll carry stuff and sponsorship. We'll do this like a sporting event, going to the moon. Is that yeah. what you remember? And you were going to get National Geographic to cover it. Yeah. We we're going to do a making of video. We we're going to follow it, all the technology. We really wanted to make an educational experience. Yeah, yeah, for sure. I mean, you and I had both been so impacted, and Larry, impacted by the lunar mission. I went home. I don't know if you know this. I, sold, I was living in Rockville, Maryland. I sold my I house in one day. I did not know that. I That's sold incredible. my house in one day. I literally took the first bid, <laughs> packed it up, and <laughs> moved to Pasadena. Wow. And, uh, and then it was, uh, we were on a mission to like build the team that could privately go to the moon. Now, people have to remember this. This is before SpaceX, before Blue Origin, before any of these companies were around. And the idea, let alone of, of building rockets, um, but the idea of building a lunar lander and going there. And we ended up um, hiring some of the best talent out of JPL. Like you said, just down the block over here, uh, Tony Spear, who had run uh, the Sojourner mission that landed on the moon, right? That little yeah. cute little robot. You put together an amazing team. Yeah. You really put together an amazing team. We they, had, they were so talented. They were. We had beautiful designs. And I remember one day you said to me, Peter, um, uh, I want to introduce you to somebody who's going to be a great director of photography. Do you remember who that was? <laughs> <laughs> Un unbelievable. Jim, Jim Cameron yeah. shows up and... Uh, oh, he, he had so many ideas oh, for how to make God. it better. He, not only was he director of photography, he had storytelling ideas. Yeah. He said, instead of just one lunar lander, you need to have two little children that move yes. near the mommy. You have and a third have person all, perspective. You, you, right. And, and, and he really, really... He really was, drove up our mass budget, yes, our budget in de de general. De de definitely. <laughs> but I mean, it's incredible to have Jim Cameron you know, br in brainstorming sessions with us of what kind of cameras we're going to use and what the positioning was and what we had to do on the moon. And I mean... 
we, we didn't even have HD cameras at that time, but he had just invented one. Yeah. So, some of the first AC footage was going to come back from the moon because the early pictures from the moon were very grainy, except for the photographs they took, but the actual live footage was poor. So we were going to solve that. And I remember we decided to keep it under wraps. We wanted to keep it a secret for whatever reasons. I guess we wanted to have a, a big, you know, debut moment. And so uh, we didn't tell anybody. We didn't announce the company. Um, I, in, in retrospect, I think we may have had some people out there really come to us if, they, if we had known it. But uh, the next thing we had to do was we had to buy, you know, we weren't building rockets. We were building the landers. So we had to go buy rockets. So the first rocket we bought was a, uh, I remember from Orbital Science that I was in the rocket business back then. Uh, we bought a, a, uh, a Taurus. Um, then the size of our, of our lander grew. And then we bought, bought a, a Taurus XL. And then the size of our lander grew. We bought a, an Athena two launch vehicle, which was in storage, which doubled the mass. And then our payload grew again. And then Larry and I were in Russia shopping, shopping for uh, rockets. This is a couple of, like a year or two before Elon went to Russia shopping. And we bought a Dnieper, which is an old ICBM that could like launch all the mass we could possibly want to the lunar surface. It was crazy. Uh, and really, then, really incredible. And then, well... Along the way, I remember, okay, you said, Peter, uh, we'll fund this, but I'm putting the first 12 million. And at this point, you know, you'd raised a billion of capital, but you're shepherding the money. Um, I think you were in, back then in the goal of taking IdealLab public and you had to buy back public shares. And, and so you said, okay, here's 12 million to start with and let's go out and raise some money. So we're out on the road together and we had a lot of people this close. Yeah, we people did. were we very Steven interested. Spielberg involved. Yeah, yeah we had a lot I mean, of people. Having James Cameron and Steven Spielberg on a private mission to the moon. I mean, it doesn't get cooler than that. I, I remember going outside and looking up at the full moon. It had a completely different meaning. Crazy. Um, yeah. Crazy. So it's really a shame it didn't work out, but it was really, really an incredible effort. Well, really the reason incredible. it worked out was the dot com crash. Uh, I'll never forget, you know, April of 2001 hits. And, you know, <laughs> you're you're trying to raise money for what? <laughs> uh, but I I think we would have had a good shot. Yeah, and it's hard as as you as we've seen since then. Yeah, it's amazing no one has done it since then. Yeah, you know, on the heels of the the company called Blastoff. A great name, it. by the way. We had Blastoff.com. Yeah, Blastoff.com. Yeah, and, and I, I like to say Blastoff splash down. <laughs> uh, my biggest achievement at the end was not bankrupting the company, but and placing the employees, I was so proud of, of placing our employees and putting the assets aside. Uh, and, and then, you know, I remember one day, this is, this is April, we have a all hands meeting, you know, you just saw the NASDAQ crash and we've got we've to put the company to moth, mothballs. I get a call from you and Larry and you say, Peter, it was, I remember it was on my birthday, it was May 20th. Wow. And, uh, he said, there's someone you have to meet. And I don't know if you remember this, but I was in a different, we're in an ideal app, uh, uh, conference yeah, you, room here. Yeah, you were down there. Yeah. And the other one over there, and in walks Adeo Ressi and Elon Musk. And Elon had just sold PayPal, uh, e e oh, it's called, uh, yeah, PayPal to eBay. And we're trying to pitch him on getting involved in, in this. Yeah, incredible. Well, there's a great story about this that relates to the bigger story of entrepreneurship and what you started the conversation with. There's many ways to make the world a better place. You can do it by being a teacher and teach people. You can be a preacher. You can be a lawyer. You can change rules and laws to make the world different. But you can be an entrepreneur. It's a really incredible way. As an entrepreneur, you can make your product that gets pulled as opposed to pushing it on mm. people. And it's, a, it's only one of the ways to make the world a better place, but it's a very powerful way. And because we had set this company up as an entrepreneurial venture, we were able to take some people who were working sort of hourly by the book, getting their job done, and unlock human potential by bringing them to a company where they felt like they're in control, they have equity, they have a say in what we do. The team you put together was amazing. It was an and, audacious and, and, mission. And it was, it was audacious. And when you get people behind an audacious mission, you can get people to do things that never would have been possible before. And that's what I love about entrepreneurship in yeah. general. You know, one of, the, one of the lessons I learned and one of the challenges 
we solved um, that I would have never thought it. You, I don't know if you remember what the most difficult part of our mission I, was. I don't, I don't. It was getting the bandwidth back oh, yeah. to the earth. For, for, the, Im for the image quality we wanted. For, for, and also then getting it distributed. So I remember going and meeting with Akamai. Remember Akamai back then? Yeah. And our largest budget item on this mission was what, first of all, we had to use the deep space network to get the imagery back from the moon. We hadn't negotiated that yet, but once it came back down to JPL or Goddard, wherever it hit the earth, to distribute it to millions of people back in 1999, 2000. Yeah, well, this is before broadband, this is before- Way before. Before fiber was everywhere. It was, it was, the budget for distribution was bigger than our launch budget. Wow. And so we came up with another company, which is what one does here at Idea Lab, was called Desktop TV. It was peer-to-peer -peer, uh, networking. I remember that, yeah. 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 It was, well, so, yeah. so many times you have to invent things to make things work, but also sometimes you have to wait for those things to be invented and at scale to help you make it. Yeah. And that, that comes back to timing, which is well, relevant no. for so many things. Yeah, we'll, we'll talk about yeah. that yeah. In, a, in a moment, one of your brilliant insights. Uh, yeah, I'll just say for folks listening, the, it frustrated me so much that this mission didn't occur because it was all of us invested so much of our time and reputation and, and energy. And it was just a beloved mission. It's like you would work on it for free, right? It was like a, it was a holy calling, right? So that's how people feel when they're working at SpaceX or Blue Origin or XPRIZE and others. We, and I remember after the Ansari XPRIZE got won in 2004, I was up at the Googleplex, Larry... Uh, was on our board and Sergey was a, a benefactor. We're that was such a huge accomplishment. Yeah, it was fun. Yeah, I, I remember the celebrations around that and just seeing the joy on people's faces when that was yeah. accomplished. Yeah, someone didn't die. <laughs> <laughs> really, really incredible. Uh, and, and so Sergey said uh, to me, what do you want to do as the next X Prize? And I told him about Blast Off and I said, I want to do a, a lunar X Prize, a lunar, you know, uh, landing. And so we took what we were planning to do with Blastoff and turned it into an XPRIZE. Google put up $30 million and it ran for 10 years. They extended it twice and no one had achieved it and they shut it down. But four alumni, three have gone to the moon um, and had an energetic landing, let's just say it that way. Unplanned. It, unplanned, <laughs> yes. <laughs> Disassembly. Uh, is, is, Israeli team went there first. Uh, then we had a Japanese team and the U.S. team. Uh, there's another U.S. team going shortly. Um, and Sort it, of proving how hard it is. It is. It's hard. It's hard. Well, I remember you said the one of the most expensive things was the bandwidth. I remember the things when the engineers were talking. It was great to listen to those great JPL engineers discuss the details they had to do. You have to worry about thermal expansion from the front to the back or the thing that's in the shade. The part that's in the shade is so cold yeah. and the part that's in the sun is so hot. Like every little detail you have to worry about when you're in space that you don't have to worry about on Earth. Really, really incredible engineering challenge. Yeah, and we can maybe look as we go through your lessons and you've just given a, a brilliant uh, DLD talk uh, on the 10 most important lessons you've learned over, over 50 years um, as an entrepreneur. And you started at the age of 12, right? So it's pretty damn good. Uh, and I can't wait to talk through them. I obviously uh, have experienced all of them in some way, yeah, shape, you, or form. Yeah, you live them, right. You, live, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but uh, they're all, it's a, a beautiful, uh, you know, distillation. And so we'll talk Thank about you. that. Maybe we can talk about part of uh, this blast off mission as an example. Uh, and then what I'd like, also like to do is talk about some of your current big moonshots. But before we do that, I want to show you a video that you haven't seen yet, and it's the sizzle reel from uh, from Blastoff. This was done by Bob Weiss. Bob was oh. uh, was my COO. Uh, he came out of Hollywood. He was a film producer. Done the Blues Brothers. Um, anyway, uh, if you don't mind going to the next slide, and let's play this video. Bob did some of my favorite movies of all time, yeah. too. Some of my favorite comedies. They're here. I really didn't know he what had made this. What if we told you that for the past year, an amazing team of scientists and engineers has been plotting a rendezvous with history? What if we told, what you, if we told you that this team wants you to be part of their mission? And what if, we told what if we told you that this was all part of a secret government program to go back to the moon for the first time in 30 years? Yeah, 
<laughs> We'd be lying. We're not the government. But we are going to the moon. <laughs> Look how old the CGI is. <laughs> it's incredible. A company called Blastoff. Wow. Blastoff.com. That's incredible. Ah, uh, it was what a what a joyful uh, couple of years that was. Amazing team and um, almost. Uh, and so now the world knows about it. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> so great, great so, memories. So, Bill, when when you're looking at, I mean, you're ultimately investing your heart and soul, your reputation, uh, your capital, investors' capital. Um, there has to be some kind of a, a threshold because how many, let me put it this way, how many ideas a day and a week and a month do you come up with? And then there's got to be a threshold like this is good enough. Th th not only good, this is, I need to, I need to do this. Yep. Right. So there's a lot, lot of factors we try and apply, but there have been 5,000 ideas that we narrow down to only starting 175 companies. So they go through a lot of gates before mm. we decide to start a company. And those gates include... One, can we find some intellectual property that we feel is unique or novel relative to what everybody else is doing? Will it really advance the state of the art? Are we doing something that wouldn't happen otherwise? Mm. Because we really want to do something that pushes a boundary and not just is repetitive to something else that's out there. So that's one criteria that we put things through. Yeah. Another is, does it grow on us? Do we keep on having the passion for it? Mm. Every company is going to be very difficult. There's always going to be challenges. Anything big and bold is hard to it, do. <laughs> so, so we're really, really looking to see if we have the passion to carry through and if we can find other leaders to have the passion to carry through. So take Blast Off as one example. If we hadn't found someone like you who was equally passionate as we were about it to take it forward and who could be a leader for it, we couldn't do it. So we were looking, and I'm really glad Larry reached out to you, and I'm really glad you said yes. But we have to do that over and over again. And... We can't always find someone like that. Yeah. So a lot of ideas fail because we can't find a team to lead it. Mm -hmm. Another criteria, we really want to make sure that other people besides us would invest. So this was the same thing with Blastoff, but it's true for many of our companies. Sure. If we could fund a company all the way ourselves, we could be deceiving ourselves by falling so in love with that child yeah. and no one else will participate with us. So we always want to find someone else to help us. And we found that when we find other people to partner with us, the odds of success go up. And we're mm -hmm. looking at batting averages here of how to yeah. get the highest batting average. So take, take the most percentage chance of company actually succeeding. So we start very early on circulating the idea with people to see if they're excited about investing in it. Mm -hmm. And if we can't get investor enthusiasm, we start shifting and shaping the idea till we do, or we don't go forward with it. Yeah, I remember you and I hitting the road to all of the you know, large venture funds and trying to find that fit. Is it a movie production? Is it an educational platform? Is it a sponsorship? You know, what's the business model for Blastoff that would get investors? And um, in 2002, there was no business model that would do it. Yeah. No. no, definitely a lot, a lot of entrepreneurs get frustrated at how many meetings you have to have to sell your idea. Yeah. But there's a few great things about it. One, you should take every one of those meetings as a way to get better and better at it. Yes. Meaning learn from each of those meetings. Learn what the objections are. Learn how your storytelling is working. Learn. You really want to make your idea sound inevitable. You actually want your idea to be inevitable, mm. like to, for the success, success of it to be inevitable. To make it inevitable, a whole bunch of things have to happen, have, have to come into place to make that true. So learning how to tell the story to make it come across that way is very, very valuable. So as much as you don't like spending the time in those meetings, as much as you don't like getting a no, and you have to be willing to get a lot of no's to get a yes, it's very, very valuable to keep on pitching it. And then when you see the support from people, when people are leaning in, when people really like it, then you really know you have something. Let's, for, for reference, uh, if you don't mind, you know, your top three to five moonshot ideas that, that you're most excited about now or historically, what are they? Well, a moonshot idea that we had a long time ago that was a wild success was helping monetize the internet. It was a company called GoTo.com. Yes, I remember it well. And, and that was 1998, so it was a long time ago. But it, it was a moonshot in the sense that it was trying to solve a very big problem of internet monetization. It also was a moonshot in the sense that at first people didn't like it, mm. meaning it was 
objected to. And eventually it was actually, uh, people booed at it when I first showed it. Like mm. people actually hissed when I, when I showed it on stage. It was at TED in 1998 when I showed it. Uh, but we really felt that it was important. And sticking with something when this people objected to something. This was bidding on AdWords. Yeah, bidding on keywords. Yeah. So bidding on keywords in a search engine. This was a time when there were barely banner ads on the web. Yeah. And certainly the idea of having money involved in search was really repellent to some people. Sure. But we, we really felt that was the way to lead to a more efficient market where people wouldn't spam as much if they could actually bid on the things that were relevant to them. So we thought it was important. Turned out to be a very impactful yeah, company. it drove Google. Yep, it, 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 we're really happy with the outcome of that. Yeah. But then fast forward to today, almost all my work is on climate. Mm -hmm. So I'm really working on new ways to make green hydrogen, new ways to store energy. I think storing energy is the final frontier in the following sense. We now can get PV panels, solar panels, that are basically cheaper than windows. You can buy a piece <laughs> of glass that's less than a window at Home Depot that makes electricity. That's, a, that's and it, amazing. And it makes electricity cheaper than any electrons have been made in all of human history. But the problem is, it's only when the sun is shining. Yeah. So if we can now have storage that is cheap enough, batteries are too expensive still, but they're coming down. If we can make storage that's cheap enough, then we really can have renewable energy that scales. Because people want power when they want it. They don't want power only when the sun is shining or the wind is blowing. How many energy companies do you have going now? We have almost 20 in the, in the overall category yeah. of climate mitigation of some form or another. And it's really, really important to me. I think it's, well, I think it's both important for the world, but it's a huge opportunity. I mean, it was a direct correlation between the energy availability to community and its GDP and its health yeah. and its education level, everything. And look at what's happening with AI right now. Yeah. The possibilities are endless. Yeah. The ability to theoretically spin up a million brains to try and solve a problem, like a million PhD students you could spin up on servers, but that's going to take a lot of energy. You know, one of the things I keep thinking about is when are we going to see AI um, come up with new physics and new chemistry? That, for me, you know, when it, when it colors between the lines and interpolates, uh, that's going to be fascinating. I think it will. I think, I, I think, I think someone too. showed recently that AI was doing something that people thought it couldn't do, prove geometry theorems, mm -hmm. something which is beyond just taking some stuff and putting it back stochastically, probability-wise. So I think we're going to see amazing things in the next five and 10 years. I tell people- Maybe even the next year. I, yeah, if you think it's moving fast now, oh, oh, <laughs> we're, yeah. we're standing still. I, I've never seen anything move this fast. Yeah. We think back to the internet rush when I first started Idea 11 in 1996, but basically with the browser in 1993, Netscape's IPO in 1995, Things were moving very fast. As you said, people were running around the building here, yeah. but they were not moving as fast as AI is moving right now. And that's because it's living based on the back of Moore's Law, exponentials, as you know, everything and exponential. And demonetized yeah. and democratized access to the most powerful technology on the planet. So entrepreneurs have won, right? So, you know, I've been talking about this with, with folks like, we're going to see one and three person unicorns, yeah. right? Yeah. And, and, and Sam Altman was talking about that recently, exactly. too. He yeah. said, we're going to see the first billion-dollar, one-person company. Amazing. And it, it, well, you've always talked about how you can really make an impact on the world when you can touch a billion people's lives or make right. a billion people's lives better. The chance to reach that many people now with something powerful is insane. Th think back to Leonardo da Vinci mm. when he was in Milan and the reach of his brain could only be as far as his horse would take him. <laughs> you know, if he could make it to Rome in a month or he could make it uh, to Florence. Uh, uh, but now our brain power is not only magnified by AI, but magnified in reach to 8 billion people at an astonishing pace. So our, our thoughts can really make a positive difference in the world. Amazing. Uh, give me three of your energy uh, moonshots right yeah. now. Yeah, so one of them is Continuum Renewables, where we're working to store energy. Continuum? Yep, Continuum. Mm -hmm. And we really want to make very, very low-cost renewable energy storage. And it's, it's working with a company of ours called Energy Vault, already a public company now, that's doing Energy gravity Vault short. is using gravity yep. as a storage yep. device, which I love. Energy Vault is building buildings to lift up weights, store that energy. Continuum wants to use mountains, so to take existing hills where we don't have so to build the structure. Up slopes. Up slopes. Yeah. So if you find a steep slope, it's almost no other way to make more cost-effective storage than to take advantage of that. Amazing. This is steel on steel still? Yeah. Uh, it's. it's uh, this is interesting. The only thing cheap enough to lift to do gravity storage is either water or dirt. 
Okay. So anything more expensive than dirt is a little bit too expensive. So we've come, <laughs> we've come up with a way to compress dirt into blocks okay. that you can lift up. Now you need a steel cable to lift them up. But they're on the, but, but on the, oh, it's, yeah, it's a steel cable, like a ski lift. Okay. Got it. Yeah. yeah. So, so you have like a gondola lift that carries a 40 ton block up the side of a mountain. That's really, really cost effective for storage. And I'm looking to scale that like crazy, both here in the U S but in the middle East, in Australia, all around the world. Amazing. Amazing. Talk about physical in nature. That's well, incredible. It, 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 it's almost like it's embarrassing that it was so simple that we didn't come up with it sooner. Right. But the reason is, again, necessity being the mother of invention. If you don't have cheap renewables, there's no reason for this. Yeah. But now that we have very, very cheap renewables, it's important. What's another one? So H Genium is a company we have that is doing thermochemical hydrogen production. So right now, most of the hydrogen, green hydrogen that's made in the world is made with electricity. Mm -hmm. But if you can make hydrogen with heat, it's even more efficient. Now, is this the company that was using focused mirrors? It could, it could use that, but it could use any form of high intensity heat. Okay. And I think if you get water to a thousand degrees C, yeah. it you, breaks down. You, you could do amazing things with high temperature and the right... The, the right methodology, this particular one, is using a really clever invention from a professor at Caltech, Mark Davis. He patented it at Caltech. We spun it out, formed this company, and it's really, really exciting. Really, really awesome. think it can make a big difference. And hydrogen, of course, is a storage medium. Yep. You know, people think yep. it as, a, yep. as, a, as an energy source. No, it's, it's a way of storing energy. Yeah. Uh, what's another one? Oh, I have. I, I know you. Go, yeah. <laughs> well, one more favorite. One more favorite child. Um, uh, we're looking at building a new way of making buildings that both generate and store their own energy. Huh. So I want to make a, a building that could be a residential building. This is a new company we have called Energy Tower that I'm working in partnership with the architecture firm SOM, Skidmore, Owens & Merrill out of Chicago. They have some great architects. And imagine a building that you could live in that both generates from solar awnings and from storage, either gravity or other storage internally, where if you live in this building, you're 100% renewable and there's no utility bill. Nice. And I really think that could be a new way we build our, our structures to reduce the carbon intensity. You know, some of the Abundance 360 members have been talking about, uh, you know, new, con new communities that are demonetizing everything, right? So energy is effectively free. Um, uh, you know, education is free. Health is demonetized. Uh, even that's a great is, mission. That's a great know, transport mission. is free, so that you could live for hundreds of dollars a month, and everything is made available. And energy for you. is the backbone of all of that. Yeah, if, for sure. if if civilization has more cheap green energy at large scale, everything will improve. Mm. How cheap can it get? What, where's it? Where is it? Uh, you know, sort of asymptotically reach? Well, right now, there are large installations in the Middle East. Mm -hmm. I just got back from COP in December. Yeah. They announced a large installation there where it was 1.4 cents a kilowatt hour uh, for, for electricity from total. the sun. Uh, but, but including storage? Not including storage. Okay. So, so it will get below one cent a kilowatt hour soon because of the large scale production of solar panels around the world. So my goal is to add storage to that for only a few cents more. So three cents all in. If you can get to that, that will be cheaper than burning any fossil fuels for electricity. So everybody wants to try and make the economy more electrified, mm -hmm. both on transportation, everything should be electrified. And if you have cheap electrons to power that, that will really be incredible. So be carbon free and less expensive. Uh, speaking about cheap electrons and making things cheap, I, I did a calculation last week, which uh, I'll put out a blog on this shortly. If you could take yourself, let's call you 100 kilograms for round numbers, and a spacesuit at 100 kilograms, and you could winch yourself up to, you know, an orbit of the space station, which is MGH, and then you could accelerate yourself to orbital velocity, which is one half mv squared. And you could, I, I know I did the numbers for seven cents a kilowatt hour all in, and you pulled it off the grid. Any idea what it would cost no, you no. for you and your spacesuit to go to orbit? No, how much? 120 bucks. That little? 120 bucks. Of energy. Of energy. And that's a seven cents a kilowatt hour. That's at seven cents. Yeah, so, yeah. yeah even, le even less if we can do I it mean, with I mean, it's fascinating, right? It, it yeah. literally, um, it's the inefficiency of rockets. Yeah. That, uh, that well, we need, we need to make a space elevator. We need to do all kinds of yes. things to try and yes. ma make that more cost effective. But it's an interesting, interesting reference number. Yeah. Um, let's jump into your to your DLD lessons, if, we, if you don't mind. Uh, again, um, I think that there... And back up one, one slide here. So 
these are your first 12 ideas, right? This is what got Idea Lab going. Yeah, well, the, the story of the starting of Idea Lab was I was running a company called Knowledge Adventure from 1991 to 1995 with my brother. Mm -hmm. And we sold that company in 1995, and the internet was taking off like crazy. And I brainstormed what ideas I wanted to start on the internet, and we had 25 different ideas. We narrowed it down to these 12, and I was trying to pick which one to start. And then I decided, I'm going to find a way to do all 12. And that was the impetus for Idea Lab. It was, let's make a place mm -hmm. where we can have shared resources, a separate CEO for each one of these companies. I will put in the initial capital. I will support the companies with everything I've learned about entrepreneurship. And we'll find a way to try and make all 12 of these work. Well, it turned out, of this first batch of 12, we gave the, we, it was a one-year experiment, actually. So <laughs> it's 28 years now, but it was a one-year experiment. <laughs> we raised $3.5 million to do a one-year experiment, a million dollars for operating expense, and $250,000 to put into each company. And of these 12, seven of them were able to get financing within the first year, beyond mm -hmm. the 250 that we put in. We made offers to people at the very beginning, very, very low salary offers, but sure. high equity offers sure. to try and take this money and make it last as far as it could. But after one year, seven of them raised additional financing. So five of them failed just by running out of money in one year. But three of them went on to go public. Amazing. So that gave us funding to continue operating after that. So we ran for a second year. More companies succeeded, ran for a third year. And then here we are now, 28 years later, still doing it. You know, there weren't that many uh, uh, venture studios or incubators back then. I don't then. know if there were any. So you th probably the first. Maybe, maybe. maybe. It was uh, the first I had heard of, for so sure. So do you call Idea Lab a venture studio? I mean, what what category do you put yeah. it in? Uh, really, we are a studio. It was a little bit. So Steven Spielberg was an investor in Knowledge Adventure. Mm -hmm. And I used to go brainstorm with him on product ideas for Knowledge Adventure during that period from 1991 to 1995. And I watched how he worked as a studio, where he'd have multiple movies in progress, he either would be an advisor, producer, or director of them. Some he would step in and direct. But most of them, he was actually a producer or advisor, put the teams together to work on them. They came to him for advice along the way, the way, same way I wanted to be advisor to CEOs. I really wanted to emulate that. I sure. wanted to be able to spread myself. So I, it was really it was really fun. And yeah. he had a beautiful place over in Universal where I would watch how he would do that because I'd have my meeting with him for half an hour, but I'd see the people came in <laughs> waiting to go in right Stacked before him. And... and uh, so I really think it's like a studio. Yeah. It's, I mean, each of these companies is like a movie or a production. And Idea Lab uh, was a company that you capitalized yourself, brought outside investors. There were there were seven investors at the very beginning who each put in five hundred thousand. Like Howard Morgan was. It was he? Howard Morgan for five hundred thousand. Yeah. Steven Spielberg, me, a bunch of people. Each put it. Ben Rosen put in the first, in the first seven of, of us. Yeah. And again, that was enough for one year. But then the company's success enabled us to continue. And then that. the business model, just for folks to understand it, when you started a company, um, one of these uh, companies, what was the economics there? You, you, I think, pretty standardized a quarter million as a capital infusion. At the, at the beginning, it was it was a quarter million. Uh, now, what we probably do is we spend fifty researching it at first before we start the company. Yeah. Then we might spend another one hundred fifty to two fifty before we decide to form the company. And then we might put in more money when we actually form the company alongside someone else's $1 million. And, uh, you know, I don't know if it was standard, but I, when we we're doing blast off, it was 20% or thereabouts was for the employees. And I think I now it's closer to 50, 50%. Yeah. yeah. You, usually we want the, not usually always yeah. we want the team who's taken the I company argued, forward. I should have negotiated harder. <laughs> the, 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 um, uh, the, the biggest lesson I learned along the way on this front was I'm starting out trying to take my ideas forward, but it has to become the company's idea. It has to become the CEO's idea. Yes. Now, in Blastoff's case, it did. It became yeah. yours. We, we handed it to you, yeah. and we let you lead the company. There were other cases where I felt remiss that why is the CEO taking this company in a different direction than the way I envisioned originally? And then I learned, no, I have to let that happen. That yeah. has to be the case. The company has to be majority owned by the people who are running the company. So Ideal Lab almost always becomes a minority shareholder very quickly. But mm. we like that. We'd rather have a minority piece but have the company succeed than try and have a larger owner stake, ownership stake but not have the motivation by the team. And then in this building uh, where you're incubating, incubating these, uh, you know, these really early stage, you have shared services, yes, uh, which yes. is an amazing part. Uh, yeah, so we have 25 people sort of in the back office that help the companies with marketing, finances, HR, HR yeah, we do their legal, payroll, right. and legal. So we, we take care of all the... 
All the stuff an entrepreneur doesn't want to yeah, deal no, with. Yeah, well, that, well, that was the inspiration. It, at, at, at Knowledge Adventure, when I was CEO, I was remembering that about 80% of my time was spent on things I didn't think were benefiting the product. Yes. And 20% of my time was spent with customers and looking at the product and thinking about that. I wanted to flip that. I wanted 80% of my time working on the exciting part mm -hmm. and only 20%. So I tried to make Ideal Lab solve that problem for CEOs. Nice. Where when they come in, you don't have to worry about that stuff. Like I, when you were running Blastoff, yeah. we had bookkeeping taken care of for you. We had all the healthcare plans taken care of for you, option plans, all, all that stuff we took care of. We took the rent, care of the rent, the yeah. building, all that stuff and you you and have, I was buying rockets. You were, uh, you, you were off in Russia buying rockets. <laughs> Everybody, I want to take a short break from our episode to talk about a company that's very important to me and could actually save your life or the life of someone that you love. The company is called Fountain Life. And it's a company I started years ago with Tony Robbins and a group of very talented physicians. You know, most of us don't actually know what's going on inside our body. We're all optimists. Until that day when you have a pain in your side, you go to the physician in the emergency room and they say, listen, I'm sorry to tell you this, but you have this stage three or four going on. And you know, it didn't start that morning. It probably was a problem that's been going on for some time, but because we never look, we don't find out. So what we built at Fountain Life was the world's most advanced diagnostic centers. We have four across the US today, and we're building 20 around the world. These centers give you a full body MRI, a brain, a brain vasculature, an AI enabled coronary CT looking for soft plaque, a DEXA scan, a Grail blood cancer test, a full executive blood workup. It's the most advanced workup you'll ever receive. 150 gigabytes of data that then go to our AIs and our physicians to find any disease at the very beginning when it's solvable. You're going to find out eventually. Might as well find out when you can take action. Fountain Life also has an entire side of the therapeutics. We look around the world for the most advanced therapeutics that can add 10, 20 healthy years to your life. And we provide them to you at our centers. So if this is of interest to you, please go and check it out. Go to fountainlife.com backslash Peter. When Tony and I wrote our New York Times bestseller, Life Force, we had 30,000 people who reached out to us for Fountain Life memberships. If you go to fountainlife.com backslash Peter, we'll put you to the top of the list. Really, it's something that is, um, for me, one of the most important things I offer my entire family, the CEOs of my companies, my friends. It's a chance to really add decades onto our healthy lifespans. Go to fountainlife.com backslash Peter. It's one of the most important things I can offer to you as one of my listeners. All right, let's go back to our episode. If you were going back in time and were starting Idealab again, would you do anything different? What have what you yeah, learned in that yeah. 20 years? Well, probably, years? probably the biggest lesson I learned, we'll talk about making bold, bold entries. I would probably focus on fewer, bigger impact companies, which is what I do now. Mm. Now, it took me a while to learn that. I learned how hard it was to make every company succeed. So it's better to make each effort bolder, more impactful, and do fewer of them. Love it, love it. Um, I wanna talk about one more thing than jump at your lessons unless it's one of them, which is it must be a challenge to get the right CEO. Oh, that's the, that's the biggest challenge. Yeah, yeah. Um, it's, it's more important than, well, we'll talk about yeah. timing. No, is, it's, it's more important, important than anything. So how do you uh, find yeah. how do you find the CEOs? Yeah, Are you yeah. constantly searching? Con constantly searching. You so, have a, you have how big is your recruiting yeah. team? Here? So we have a big recruiting team. We also work with recruiters. But I go to conferences, and whenever I see people that I'm excited about, I just start talking about ideas. When I see someone lean in, the way you did on Blastoff. Mm -hmm. We want to find someone who's going to sell their house <laughs> in a day, in a day. So, so, so we're, we're looking for someone who, after I've told them a bunch of ideas, yeah. calls me back sometime in the next week and says, I can't sleep anymore. I'm thinking about that idea so much. Amazing. And if that happens, but that, that, that takes a lot of, you have to take a lot of shots on goal to find, to make that happen yeah. because the, the odds of connecting with someone perfectly, the odds of them being at the right time in their life. The odds of them falling in love with with my idea and then making it theirs. But now we learn how we have Do to you let, ever take, let them make it theirs. Does someone come to you and say, I have this great idea. I'd love to incubate it yeah. at Idea Lab. Usually we don't do that. Have but, you done but, it? We've done it a few times. Usually if they come to us with a great idea, which is either very close or almost exactly the same as something we also already wanted to do. And the reason is 
I've already got 50 things I'm trying to do. <laughs> I, I don't have the time to put into another one that, yeah. that is not one. So yeah. people want that. And uh, there should be a company to do that, right. but it's not us. Right. Beautiful. Yeah, but that's actually more what YC does. Of course. Yeah. So, so VCs and YC and other incubators take inbound ideas and then pick the ones they want to work on. We are more the other way. We have outbound ideas and we pick the people who want to, who want to take them forward yeah, for us. You have 4,850 ideas. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. We, we, <laughs> on the we, list. Yeah. All right, let's go on to the first here. Yeah. So um, the, the, um, the first lesson yes. of, the, of the most valuable ones I learned was challenging the status quo, being bold. Yeah. And we, we've talked about that already. And uh, what I would say, we, we love this quote so much from Schopenhauer, we have it on the building when you walk in, that all truth passes through three stages. First, it's ridiculed, often ridiculed. Second, it's violently opposed. So when does the idea get opposed? When it starts getting some traction and you start threatening some incumbents, yes. your ideas often get opposed. Yeah. And you have to make it through that stage. If you make it through those two stages, then your idea becomes self-evident. And then you've actually changed the world because now you've made something happen that wasn't going to happen otherwise. Because if it was if it was first ridiculed and then opposed, it means other people gave up. Yeah. And if you make it happen. So I really love when we have a contrarian idea that some people oppose, some people laugh at, but we have enough conviction that it's important that we carry forward. Go to was the example of that I told yeah. you then. But even even the gravity storage that I'm working on now, there are a lot of people who think that's a crazy idea. Your quote, I love uh, it. Yeah, yeah. Your quote comes up to the me all the time. The day before something is yeah, truly yeah, yeah. a breakthrough, it's a crazy idea, and and that's uh, yeah. you know, Bert, I took that from Bert Rutan. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, um, I love I, it. I, I live that. Yeah. Uh, and and convincing people to follow you when it's still in the crazy idea phase is a challenge. Yeah. But then the, when it becomes a breakthrough, pe people people yeah. are like, oh, it always seems obvious to them after yes. it's a breakthrough. Yes, right. You know, uh, success has many parents. Failure has one. <laughs> uh, I, and. That's one of the lessons I really want, you know, the entrepreneurs, uh, I'll call them moonshot entrepreneurs listening, uh, the amount of work you need to do to take on a big, bold, meaningful uh, effort and just something to try and make money, a lot of times can be the same. It, it almost is always. But basically, anything is going to have a trough of despair in the middle. We'll get to yes. that, that, that yeah. story later. Everything is going to be hard. Walt Disney had it hard. Yeah. Steve Jobs had it hard. Got, they've got fired. Got fired. Had to come back to his company. Walt Disney was practically broke when he was trying to make Disneyland happen. Uh, um, I remember that famous quote. I had, he said, "I owe fifty million dollars. I must be rich." <laughs> <laughs> I didn't hear that one, but that's a great one. But uh, it's going to be hard. Yeah. There's very, very few stories that are just purely up and to the right. Uh, you often and, hear and it's told that way mistakenly. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. And what you don't know, it was an overnight success it, 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 after 11 years of hard work. <laughs> exactly. So since it's going to be hard, may as well do something bigger. Yeah. May as well do something you really care about. Now, doing something you really care about that's important is valuable. It doesn't have to be uh, so controversial. But making it be bold, uh, so, so th this, 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 this is so good because making it be bold not only means you're making a bigger impact, but sometimes you actually have more success by being bold because you need to stand out anyway. Yes. So it, it's almost like a few haters are okay because the boldness will win people over, both recruits to your company, investors, if you tell the story properly, yeah. but to make the, the bigger impact. So I, I really feel- I, I could not agree more. You know, it's why I named my own fund Bold <laughs> Capital uh, just because after my, after my book. But one of the things I, I realized early on is when you have an idea, um, and uh, you've said this before, you know, the idea, the, the value, the amount of work coming up with the idea compared to the amount of work it takes to actually build a successful company yeah. marginalizes to zero. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it, it, it's crazy. It's 1%, 99%. <laughs> yeah. There's Not only is, is there 99% of the work after coming up with the idea, and that's why I often encourage people to, and people are often resistant about this, just to start telling your idea to everybody. Yes, don't keep it secret. Yeah, yeah tell your idea to everybody. Because people uh, will tell you, yeah, I've oh, tried yeah, it, yeah, it yeah, failed yeah, for yeah, these yeah, reasons, yeah, learn yeah, from yeah, them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so you have to have a thick skin to take the criticism on it, but to tell, tell your idea to everybody. You don't have to worry about someone stealing no your idea. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, that. No one's going to uh, uh, Now, you still should try to protect it in any way you can also, but you shouldn't worry about telling people. It's more valuable to tell people and get the lessons from that than, to, than mm -hmm. the risk. But uh, definitely, um, it's 1% on the idea. The reason it's 99% after is not only all the hard work, but the iterations you're going to make. You're going to take a winding path, and we'll get to a slide on iteration mm -hmm. in a moment. But your idea is not going to be the same. When it sees the light of day, the, the, the great quote, 
<laughs> from Mike Tyson <laughs> about everybody has a plan until they get punched in the face. Yes, I, so I never true. thought I'd be quoting Mike Tyson in a business <laughs> situation, but it's totally true. Your business idea gets punched in the face metaphorically when you go out and bring it to the market, when you bring it to investors, when you bring it to customers. And that getting punched in the face is how you adjust your match, how, yeah. how, you, how you adapt. And, and adaptability is everything. It's everything. Yeah. It's everything. Yeah. So, so I, I wish there were a way someone in an interview, you could just see their adaptability score right there. Like if only you had a, like SATs don't tell you that. Grade point average and when you went to school doesn't tell you your adaptability. But adaptability is a very, very valuable thing. It's what allowed, uh, you know, mammals to survive over dinosaurs. Yeah. 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 So, I, so, I use, I liken the, astro the asteroid impact, you know, as exponential tech hitting the world right now, right? Yeah. Everything's changing yeah. so yeah. fast that unless you're adaptable, you're not going to yeah. make it. Um, what's lesson number two? So I, I do have your quote in there. Um, day before something is a breakthrough, it's a crazy idea. I have it right there in my in my deck. Yes. And I just I just love that so much. But definitely, this is just reiterating this last point. Uh, something that's just incremental is maybe straightforward, but not going to be as rewarding, both psychologically and yeah. probably financially. But doing something like going from vacuum tubes to silicon, that's a breakthrough. That's a big change, yeah. a step function that really can make the world different. You know, the other thing which is true is when you have an idea you gloss over the problems and the closer you get the more you see the blemishes and the issues that you have to overcome and it's going to be no matter what you're doing and so unless what i the terminology i use is unless it's you know related to your massive transformative purpose right what oh, wakes yep. you up in the morning yes. keeps you going your captures your shower time yes you're going to give up yep because you don't care about it enough yeah yeah. So next lesson, use naysayers as rocket fuel. So this quote from Coco after she won the U.S. Open last year, this mm. I was I was practically getting goosebumps when I heard her say this. Nice. She got up and the microphone mid-court and said, I really want to thank the people who didn't believe in me. <laughs> you weren't pouring water on my fire. You were giving me rocket fuel. Love it. And you were pouring fuel on my fire. And if you're going to do something bold, you're going to have naysayers. Of course. So you need to find a way to turn that into positive motivation and not and not be brought down by it. And uh, I just love that because I try to live that. Yeah. But she said it so well. Yeah. And I, I really got goosebumps when she said you know, that. I, I define expert as someone who can tell you exactly how it can't be done. <laughs> right? <laughs> Um, so, so I, I just love this, and and I and I live that. I lived through the dot com crash. You know, we, I, talk, we I talked remember about that. this. Yeah. I remember <laughs> that this is a month before the dot com crash. Yeah, yeah. So, so, so um, yeah. uh, people <laughs> people were making fun of us. People were saying, "Bill, you're crazy. Entrepreneurship is over. Don't you understand? It doesn't have to be entrepreneurship anymore." Like people were actually saying, and "I, I uh, love the uh, is Enron overpriced." Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yep. Uh, so, so the 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 arrows that were thrown at us. Yes. Um, we had to per persevere through it. Yeah. And people were actually telling us, like the, the, this graph of the rise of the NASDAQ and then the crash of it afterwards, um, people were saying, you can't make companies anymore. No one wants those anymore. <laughs> and we were saying, are you kidding me? Uh, uh, in fact, when we looked at this, if you looked at the internet usage, minutes spent, dollars spent, all that, the, the, the line was going straight up and to the right. The only thing that took a dip was valuations. Mm. So, the internet was real. Yes. This was not a fad that was going away. Yes, the valuations had gone skyrocketing relative to the relative usage, but everything continued going up and to the right, and it fully caught up with itself three or four years later. Yep. So, but those three or four years were tough to per persist when no one wanted to talk about it. Yeah. And, and uh, I remember we had to fund a lot of our companies exclusively ourselves, and that led to the lesson, which is we shouldn't do that. We mm. should really get partners. Mm. Uh, even when, even if we have enough money to fund them ourselves, we want to have people alongside of us. But it was, it was hard. It was hard. But that, that's that's where I learned this lesson to take the naysayers and use them as rocket fuel. I love that. Yep. Uh, the next lesson I, I gave a whole TED talk about this. Yeah. And about by the way, if you're listening to this and you haven't seen uh, Bill's TED talk on timing, uh, I think it's about eight years ago. Yeah, yeah. Um, 2015, it, I think. It's a, a fantastic TED talk. Yeah. Thanks. So this this. Um, this was a result of looking back at that time period at 20 years of companies and saying, really, what happened? Why, why did the ones succeed, succeed? Why did the ones fail? And there's many, many reasons. Of course, they all eventually fail because they run out of money. But, but uh, uh, why do they run out of money? Yeah. They run out of money because the world isn't quite ready for what you have yet. And, and Last Office may be a perfect example. Yes. Now, that had dot-com implications and others. But the bandwidth wasn't there. 
the cameras weren't there. You know, so many things, we were trying to invent so many things outside of our area that weren't core to the, our core mission, mm -hmm. literal mission in this, yes. in this case. But think about some other companies. Uber succeeded for many reasons. But Uber succeeded because GPS had just become available widely in phones. iPhone had just come out. Yeah. If you try with a GPS in every unit. Yes. If you tried to make Uber two years earlier, it would not have made it. And Uber did not cause GPS to be available in everybody's pocket. Someone else did. Further, Uber, Uber. succeeded really well because there was a big recession going on yeah. and they could recruit drivers very inexpensively because people needed extra money. Yeah. That timing was perfect. Now, they didn't make that timing happen, but they got lucky. Yeah. But you, what you can do to make your luck better on timing is look at the world and look at where people are and look what technologies are adopted. We had a company, one of our biggest lessons, we, have a, we had a company called Z.com, mm. which we started in 2000. I remember that. And we, I, we, I was here then. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, so here, here's what we were doing. We were looking at the success of the e-commerce companies we had in the 90s and saying, what's going to come online next? Entertainment. And we had the relationship with Steven Spielberg. So we wanted to start a company to bring entertainment online. Because of Steven Spielberg, we got introductions to Chris Rock and Adam Sandler. I met with them personally, gave them 10% equity in the company and a million dollars for exclusive content from them. Mm. We hired a great team from Disney. Uh, we had um, Mike Lang and Joe D'Annunzio leading the effort. We hired 70 people in the studio over in Burbank. We started putting together this great content but there's no broadband penetration. You couldn't even watch a video in your browser without downloading codecs and doing all kinds of plugins, weird stuff. Yes. Yeah, plugins. Yeah. Uh, so the company grew, 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 great stuff, great stuff, and went out of business in 2003. A year later, Flash comes out, and now you can at least watch a video in your browser. And a year later, we YouTube. cross 50% broadband penetration and YouTube comes out. Yeah. So we, we almost could have been YouTube yeah. if we had waited a little bit longer. So one of the lessons I've learned, I'm curious about it in relation to this, is living long enough to live forever. Yes, so, that's very crucial. Yeah, so um, you know, for me, um, I had uh, a, <laughs> I missed a couple of these timing-wise. Yeah. The last one I missed was uh, Planetary Resources, an asteroid mining company. Yeah. Uh, and we had amazing team and we were, you know, Chris Lewicki, who was part of Blastoff was, was our uh, chief engineer and then CEO. And, you know, SpaceX was launching. Um, we had just passed the laws to allow private ownership of asteroidal material, which was a big deal to get yeah. those laws changed in the US and in Luxembourg. And these asteroids are multi-billion dollar to trillion dollar assets. Um, but the timing, and yeah. I still yeah. think it's probably another five years out. Yeah. Um, I'd love to take another shot yeah. at that. Well, what, what we always encourage our CEOs to do, sometimes they listen, sometimes they don't, sometimes it's, it might not be right to listen, is take the money you have, spend it slowly so you last long enough. Yeah. And well, Z.com, if we had taken the $10 million we raised and spent it at $2 million a year instead of $3 million a year, we might have been there. Well, the other lesson here is building interim revenue engines, building yeah. interim products, right? So, you know, if you can, uh, if as a company, you can start generating revenue um, and oh, keep your and anything, stretch your runway. Anything you could do to last longer. Yeah. So you're really at that point intercepting good luck. Yeah. Right. Abs I mean, absolutely. When you look at SpaceX, for example, SpaceX uh, is exactly the story of the yeah. right timing. Right. So uh, so Elon builds Falcon One, failure, 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 success on his fourth launch, which he had to borrow the money to to make that happen. But what had just occurred was the space shuttle program was shut down. Yep. And because the space shuttle program had been shut down, uh, they put out a, uh, a RFP for com crew commercial yep. vehicles, and he won that after his fourth launch was successful and got a billion dollar contract when he was, you know, yeah. in yeah, negative yeah, yeah. cash flow. No. Yeah. Finding any way to stay alive until your market is ready for you. So, by definition, if you're doing something bold and new, you're ahead of your time. Yes. So you need to. Catch up. You need to catch up to the right time. Mm -hmm. And by staying alive long enough, it's it's hard to do. It's really hard to do because yeah. you have to have the patience. You have to have the perseverance. You have to find these other revenue sources. You have to beg, borrow, and steal for money. You have to beg, borrow, and steal for customers just to stay alive long enough. So timing was one, number one. <clears throat> and again, the advice yep, there yep. is uh, use your money wisely and start generating revenues as early as you can. Number two, team and execution. Yeah, definitely. Um, Finding the, the team, like we were talking about, yeah. who's passionate about it, 
who has the perseverance to fight through the tough times, who takes the arrows in the back and turns them into motivation, because you're going to have a lot of, lo a lot of no's to yeah. make success. And again, the stories that you often hear sound up and to the right, but it never is that smooth along the way. Yep. Yeah, for sure. Uh, but the other thing that I, I most recommend about timing, I think now, is that you can't control timing. So just be honest about it. Mm. Like, be honest if the world isn't ready. I'll give you one other example from Please. ours. Uh, around 2001, I had an idea I was calling my life. And my life was going to be a bracelet that you wear that tracks all your vitals, that tries to predict cancer or other disease by looking at every single we can and doing matching between post facto doctor visits and what signals we saw months earlier. People came to me and said, I'm not going to wear something all the time that monitors signals. Are you crazy? It's too privacy. And now look, we all have something yeah. on our, we, everybody accepts that now. We were just far too ahead of the mentality of people willing to do that. Of course, 10 years later, Fitbit came out, and then that gradually wore people down. And now if you sold something that could save people's lives, that all they had to do was wear something, they'd say, of course, no problem. Yeah. So, so, so uh, you can be, we were, so that company failed in around 2002. We couldn't find any investors to participate, and we didn't, we didn't really go forward with it. But being honest about the feedback you're getting on would people really accept what you're doing is very important. Yeah. That is true. Not yep. deceiving yourself. Yep. Yep. Exactly. So these are just a bunch of different companies where the timing was good. Timing wasn't as good. Uh, 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 this was I was actually talking about again how PV panels are now so cheap. They're not only cheap, <laughs> a, a four times cheaper yeah, for a PV panel than, than, a, window. than a window. Right. Right. <clears throat> so so you could buy a window with a frame <clears throat> that does nothing except let light in, and that costs four hundred seventeen dollars. And you could buy a PV panel of the same size that costs one hundred nine dollars, and it makes electricity. So that. Um, well, this is another lesson from, from you, from exponential. When you have a learning curve to drive down the cost, you get exponential cost reductions over time. As you yeah. make things in, in exponentially large volume, it almost follows Moore's law kind of effect. So there are very few, we don't make windows at the scale, we make PV panels. Amazing. Of the same size and of the same yeah. format. So it really is incredible. But uh, uh, I was talking about how AI feels like the internet in 1995, but faster, even faster. I mean, I I thought about this. Uh, Bill Gross must be having a heyday yeah, yeah. on idea generation. Well, I, I, I would be. I would have a heyday on it, except I weren't so focused on climate. Yes. So I still have AI ideas, and I do. I do them, but not 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 one a week like I, I should. I could be. <laughs> okay. Lesson number four: iterate like crazy. Amazing. Uh, I definitely feel we talked about it earlier. It's not your initial idea. It's how you respond to the market. And you really need to be listening to customers, listening to feedback, adjusting things along the way. And I actually think you win on iteration, how fast you can learn per time. Yeah, agility. agility. Yeah, really, and, really matters. And running experiments and actually aggressively running experiments. I remember one of uh, my favorite quotes from, from Jeff Bezos is, uh, our success at Amazon is a function of the number of experiments we run per year, per month, per week, and per day. Totally. Yeah. Yeah. So, so uh, I joke. I should have called it Iterate Lab, not Idea Lab, because yes. iteration is more important than the idea. But Idea Lab sounds better. But iterate <laughs> is what you really have to do. And and uh, back to the Jeff Bezos quote. Uh, I call it uh, learning per time turns on knowledge. Every time, you, if you're a startup, you're competing against a big company, probably some incumbent somewhere. Whether it's Google, whether it's uh, uh, yeah. Price Waterhouse, Exxon, you know, whatever. Right. Yeah, right. Whoever you're competing with, they're, they're, they're better funded. They have more people. They have more brand. What do you have? You have agility. That's the one thing you, you have can, willingness to fail. Both those. <clears throat> yeah. I mean, one of the biggest challenges I see is the large corporations. Um, yeah, and this is, also, this is also true of the wealthiest individuals are afraid of doing anything that makes them look foolish and failing. Right. And it's like, I celebrate those entrepreneurs like yourself like Elon Musk, that are willing to like just bet it all over and over and over again. And individuals who are hoarding their cash, it's like, you know, you still can't take it with you. Yeah. I mean, do something, change the world for God's yeah. sakes. Yeah. Well, on, on the willingness to fail, uh, I wanted Ideal Lab to be a safe place for people to do experiments like that. And <clears throat> no matter how much you say, we want people to do that. People watch what really happens. And if they see anybody ever lose their job by taking a chance, then they won't do it. Yes. So one of the structures of Ideal Lab that we put in place to mitigate that was if a company fails or if a person makes an idea in a company that fails, one, we celebrate the learning. Yes. But two, if that company actually goes out of business, we try and take the best people and just re 
put them in a yeah. new company. So we really fertile, want to make fertilizer. it safe. <laughs> we, we, we really want to make it safe for people to take chances. And the only way they'll, they'll really feel that safety is if they see that they are safe. Yeah. Not, not, not the words you use, but the actuality of what I, happens. Agreed. Yep. And this <clears throat> sounds very much like Astro Teller at, at, at Google yeah. X, right? And yeah. I asked Astro one day, why are you so secretive um, at, <clears throat> at X? And uh, his, answer, his answer surprised me. He said, I want you to imagine the rate at which our companies fail here. And if the San Jose Mercury News, whatever right, it's called, right, was right. was announcing Google fails another company, another right, company, right, right? Yeah. But that that is, you said it. You said another important advantage that a startup has over a big company. A big company has a reputation to protect, and they can't announce those failures. Yeah. And they can't announce them. They might leak out, so they just don't take them. They don't take the chances. And may, maybe even the Google versus OpenAI example of recent is is one example of sure. Google sort of inventing that uh, that technology. And for years before. Years before, yeah. but but it's a little too risky for them to release something that could damage Google's reputation. But for another startup who has nothing to lose, well, the other example here is YouTube and Google Videos. Yeah, right. So Google yeah, Videos yeah. preceded YouTube by some time. Oh, is that true? I didn't know. Yeah, that. no. And and YouTube started going up into the right because Google's lawyers. Oh, exactly. Were like, yeah, yeah. you can't put that on. Yeah, you yeah, can't yeah. put that on. And so when Chad Hurley was allowing anybody to put any videos on there. Their user adoption was so high, you know, Larry yeah, and Sergey yeah, yeah, had no other yeah, option but to buy yeah, them. Yeah, no, it's a, it's a perfect example. Yeah. But but that's why a startup has to take advantage of that. Yeah. If you if you have that advantage, you got to use it because that's almost the only advantage you have compared to all the other great advantages that the big company has. That's so true. Yep. Yeah. Uh, so next one, create a remarkable offering. So this is a little bit related to being bold, but uh, this great quote from Robert Stevens, mm. uh, who did Geek Squad at at a. Uh, uh, Best Buy. Oh, yes. Uh, um, yeah, yeah. Uh, is marketing is a tax on being unremarkable. <laughs> and I, I love it because it really says it's true. You, if you have to spend money to convince people about your product, that's the marketing dollars you have to spend. But if you just make your offering incredible in the first place, that is your marketing. Yes. And I always, I love this because I'm always trying to, whenever I'm pitching an idea, I want the idea to stand out and sound incredible. But coming up with the right way to make your offer stand out is really, really important. And it could be anything. I don't know if you remember. When Google first launched Gmail, I think they launched it on April Fool's Day in a given year mm -hmm. when they offered you a gigabyte of free email. And that sounded like such a crazy offer. They made it sound like it was a April I Fool's fake. Yeah. <laughs> but it was real. <laughs> and they made an offering that sounded so exciting that people were rushing to go try it out. And I think you need to try and do that with everything. Now, of course, giving away a gigabyte of email now costs nothing because storage is so cheap. And, yeah. and now they have advertising to cover it. But, but the, the, and now it's a business too. You can buy the business version of Gmail. Mm -hmm. But coming up with a way that your offering sounds irresistible to people is very important. Again, especially if you're a startup, you have limited funds, you have limited budget, you have limited way to stand out. Making and your offering- Signal above the noise. Uh, really, do you have any really. good examples from your recent companies that you that you love? Uh, I, I like going out and offering. We came up with an idea of offering whatever your cost is for energy. We'll do a deal with you that's just ten percent less. Mm -hmm. Just show us your bill, and we'll charge you ten percent less. So that way, it's a no risk. You're going to save money in the first month. That would be an example of a remarkable offering. Just right. coming up with anything that makes it so obvious for people to just say, "Wow, that's too yeah. hard to pass up." Uh, Yes, ir irresistible offer. Yep. Uh, next is being success sensitive. So we talked about this. You asked about how much equity we give yeah. out early early on. And um, I learned that it's so hard to make a company work. And you so badly want every one of them to work that forget about dilution. Just do whatever it takes to make the thing successful. The ratio of yep. something to nothing is infinite. So, so, so <laughs> gi give out the equity liberally. Make sure everybody wins. Make sure investors get a good deal. Make sure employees have a good deal. Make sure everyone is aligned. When you have alignment, you have more success. And to be so worried about each point of equity, which yeah. is hard to give up as, as an entrepreneur. It's, it's, but I, I learned- I, I could not agree more. Yep. The, the times that I have been, I have- failed on a couple of occasions when I drove the valuation up too fast. Yes, yes. And then you inevitably stubble because yeah, yeah. you're doing something big and bold, it's yeah, hard. Yeah. And then it's, you're, it, you're doing a down round. So it's very you, intoxicating to drive the valuation up, but it's also dangerous. It is dangerous. It's dangerous. Yeah. And I learned that lesson and I, I really try and convince CEOs. They, sometimes CEOs get this offer, someone wants to offer them a little bit more money or a little bit lower valuation, and they're they're 
grinding themselves about where they should take it. And I say, just take it. Just <laughs> If that person's going to help you be successful, just do it. Just, When's the best time yeah. to raise money? <laughs> right now. <laughs> right, right. So getting great alignment between everybody is really, really important. Yeah, beautiful. Uh, that is maturity, by the way. Oh, that, yeah, that, yeah. That's, yeah. That yeah. comes with maturity and experience. and wi It's wisdom. Is, is it? Yeah, definitely learned that one the hard way, but, yeah. but very, very valuable. Yeah. Building a complementary team. Um, definitely, I learned, it took me until I was 35 years old to learn this one. I wish I had learned this one when I was in, in college. Uh, I was hiring people like me. Yeah. I was looking for people like you, yeah. like my brother, yeah. like other people, to surround myself with people with the same view as me. But to be successful in a company, you need a whole range of people. And this, this chart is a good example of it. If this, is a, if this chart is time on the x-axis and success on the y-axis, the entrepreneur, the E-type person, starts the company. You, that's the only person who can start a company. It's the person with the, who's a dreamer, person who's got the idea. So the company goes up and to the right for a little while. But if the entrepreneur can't get anything done, can't finish, can't ship a product, or mm. can't get, then the company will eventually fail. Now, just because you're an entrepreneur doesn't mean you can't finish something. Like you and I both know how to, we yeah. know how to graduate college, we know how to get our papers done, <laughs> we know how to, uh, and we know how to build something. But you eventually have to bring the P or producer skill into the company next. And the P skill is the ability to finish the product, ship the product, get in customers' hands, get a customer to buy it, raise the money, pay the bills. So the P skill is necessary in a company too. But even that will only carry you so far. Eventually, if you only have E and P skill in the company, you'll fail as well. Now you need some A skill. So what's the A skill? That's the skill that I have none of. Not only do I have none of, I have negative. Of, I, I'm negative. Staff, yeah, yeah. Yes. A is chief of staff. A is the administration. A is the is the operations. Uh, uh, all the operations. It, it's opening the bank account. It's ma paying the bills on time. It's making the payroll. It's getting people's healthcare plan set up. It's, it's all the stuff we have no no patience for. Well, stuff that you and I have no patience <laughs> for. But there's some people who who that, that's what's incredible. There's people who that not only have patience for it, they love that. <laughs> but I didn't understand that. I didn't. I, I so thought that everybody hates that. I couldn't understand there were people who actually love that, and I wanted to find someone like that to compliment me. Yes. And I finally learned that. But then even further than the A, and you need the A, so the A, the A is the person who sort of makes the trains run on time, makes everything work together. But even beyond that, you'll still fail because all those three personality types, they sort of hate each other's guts. The A doesn't like the P, the P is demanding and is a bull in a china shop. The P wants to make sales and, and it feels like the A is holding them back. The E wants to invent new things and it feels like the P and the A are holding them back. Yeah. So you need I. The I is the integrator or the skill that can bring those people together and solve conflict. Now, again, it doesn't have to be a separate person. It usually is. Well, it may soon be an AI that's doing a number of these things exactly. for you. <laughs> exactly. So, so you need to find these other skills. For me, I didn't even know those existed, Yeah. let alone could I get along with them. But once I learned that there were wonderful I's that could help m me match with P's and A's, it was fantastic. And it's still hard. Like, even me describing this makes it sound like I'm good at this. It's yeah. still hard. Pe the people part of the equation is still the hardest part and the most important. Yeah. Uh, but, it, but if you can get all those skills yeah. in harmony, you have an unstoppable company. And when you have these, all these in harmony, you have an advantage culturally over another company that doesn't. Like that, that, this is where culture can beat another company. Yeah. So you can win a company with IP, better business model, better capitalization, better marketing and all that, but you can also win with better culture. Because if you have all these people in harmony, you really are unstoppable. You can do things that, that other people can't touch. Amazing. So th that, that's the, the complimentary team. Be a personal growth learning machine. We talked about this a little bit earlier, but this is about getting feedback, improving yourself, Learning new things, learning new skills, like me learning that there's an A, mm. me learning that there's an I type person. But uh, I, I, I heard this one statement once, closing the gap. Sometimes I see people who I admire and I say, how could I be like that? Like they're exhibiting some skills that I, I don't know how to do that. Mm -hmm. Rather than thinking about the big leap between me and them, I think about, let me just close the gap a little bit. Let me just try and close the gap between me and that skill a little bit each week or each month. Let me just get a little closer. It was a way of me thinking about it being not so big of a chasm that I had to cross to get there. Got it. And what little skills could I pick up that will make me a little bit better at the things that I'm lacking right now? I mean, there, there is a, a school of thought that says if you're excellent in, in skills A, B, and C and don't have D, E, and F, right. Double down on A, B, and C. Uh, absolutely. But there are, there are, and I agree with that. Right. Uh, but if there are skills 
D, E, and F that are pulling you down, that are negating you, that are, that are hurting your other skills, you could find a way to minim minimize that. Mm. And that's an example of closing the gap for me. So, And what, do you do this with a, with a mentor? Do you do this by reading? Uh, uh, How do you do this? Mentor, coach, reading, and feedback. Mm -hmm. and, and understanding... Well, asking for feedback, learning how to take feedback and accept it, learning how it's not personal but but beneficial, having people you trust to give you feedback that's valuable. One of my, my favorite hard. sayings, uh, I was in a conversation uh, at a Goldman Sachs event with Elon, and he said, you know, my friends tell me what's great. My best friends tell me what sucks. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. you really need some best friends. Yeah. Some best friends to tell you what sucks and to just make some impact on closing the gap, not eliminating it completely. It's too hard. You're not going to change yourself and you don't want to... You don't want to eliminate the strengths, but finding a way to make it as an incremental improvement to be a little bit better. Did you see the movie Oppenheimer? If you did, did you know that besides building the atomic bomb at Los Alamos National Labs, that they spent billions on biodefense weapons, the ability to accurately detect viruses and microbes by reading their RNA? Well, a company called Viome exclusively licensed the technology from Los Alamos Labs to build a platform that can measure your microbiome and the RNA in your blood. Now, Viome has a product that I've personally used for years called Full Body Intelligence, which collects a few drops of your blood, spit and stool, and can tell you so much about your health. They've tested over 700,000 individuals and used their AI models to deliver members critical health guidance, like what foods you should eat, what foods you shouldn't eat, as well as your supplements and probiotics your biological age, and other deep health insights. And the results of the recommendations are nothing short of stellar. You know, as reported in the American Journal of Lifestyle Medicine, after just six months of following Viome's recommendations, members reported the following, a 36% reduction in depression, a 40% reduction in anxiety, a 30% reduction in diabetes, and a 48% reduction in IBS. Listen, I've been using Viome for three years. I know that my oral and gut health is one of my highest priorities. Best of all, Viome is affordable, which is part of my mission to democratize health. If you wanna join me on this journey, go to viome.com Peter. I've asked Naveen Jain, a friend of mine who's the founder and CEO of Viome to give my listeners a special discount. You'll find it at viome.com Peter. Number nine, assess your commitment. We talked about this earlier. Yeah. This is, do you wake up, and I told you about recruiting CEOs, do you wake up and say, I can't, I, I can't sleep over this idea, it's too important to me. Yes. So I taught a class in entrepreneurship at Caltech this last term. It's the first time I've ever done that. How it big was, was the class? It was 31 students. Uh, it was half I would, graduates, I half under, yeah. class. <laughs> well, we, we filmed it, I'm gonna try and get it online. But uh, it was really, really way harder than I thought, but way more rewarding than I thought. It was really fun. And I, I taught them about these kinds of things and I helped them create business plans, take their ideas forward. And then yeah. we're, we're having a business plan competition that we funded so that they can get, get some awards to try and take their ideas forward. And uh, when I was having them come up with 10 ideas, they're saying 10 ideas. I'm not as, I'm not as good at ideas as you are, Bill. Uh, I said, just come up with 10 ideas. They don't even have to be ideas. Just even come up with 10 problem statements, meaning things in the world that you wish were better. Yeah. Like, I hate traffic on the 405 and I wish there was a way I could, uh, anything. Just come up with something that you don't like that you wish were different. That, that's an idea as far mm -hmm. as I'm concerned. So everybody in the class came up with 10 ideas. Then I said, now, next, next, that was homework assignment number one. Next homework assignment, you're going to pare them down. So how are you going to pare them down? I'm going to give you a spreadsheet with 16 columns in it. You're going to pick any 10 of those columns and give a score. So one column is, what's the size of the market? One column is, are you capable of doing this? How hard would it be to recruit people to do it? Um, how good would the margins be in this business? And on and on and on. And you pick any of the columns you want, but I just want you to fill up a spreadsheet, a 10 by 10 matrix, just so you can figure out which of these you're going to take forward for your business plan sure. in this class. And one of the columns is, how committed to you are this idea? Would you spend a week on it, a month, a year? How long would you spend on it? So two people in the, in the class came back on that column and said, I would spend the rest of my life on this. Mm -hmm. I said, you spend the rest of your life on this. Oh, yeah, I care about this so deeply. Well, that's your idea. Forget the other nine columns. You don't yeah. have to worry about anything else. Yes. That's the criteria. Yeah. So if you can assess your commitment to something and decide, I care about this so much that I'll go to the end of the earth for it. That's the way you should decide. Yeah, I, and, I could and, not agree more. You know, in the parlance of what uh, what I write and, and teach, I, I call that your massive transformative yeah, yeah, purpose. Exactly, right? exactly. 
and 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 uh, this is just my way of saying that same thing. But yeah. but using a how long would I be willing to commit to this as a filter for your life for your ideas is a really great and, one. And so I think a lot of entrepreneurs don't realize it takes a decade. Yeah, yeah. It, it takes at least a decade. You know, point at any company. Um, you know, uh, people don't realize SpaceX is you know got twenty plus years old yeah. right now. Right. Yeah. It's. It, it does. It says it does take a long time. It stinks, you, but you, it does take that long. And you just you don't know about it during its formative ages, its formative years. Yeah. So you really have to be committed. Yeah. So so I'm committed to this climate work that I'm doing right now. Uh, uh, it, also, know, it also happens to be the biggest business opportunity. Uh, it, 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 well, <laughs> it, it has a few things. It's the biggest business opportunity. It matches my skill. I'm a mechanical engineer, and I love doing things like that. So I'm choosing mechanical related things in the climate, but also I'll work on it for the rest of my life. So. It's exactly meets that criteria. Yeah. I didn't even think about it that way, but it was really resonating with me when these two two young women said that about their ideas in this class Amazing. About, about being important criteria. And then finally, be persistent. So yes. this this uh, graph is so great. Uh, every idea you start out with, like with Blastoff that we talked about earlier, but every idea I started out with, it's always this is the best idea ever. That's all, that's you wouldn't start it if you didn't feel that. But then after you get into it, you start learning there are challenges. Yeah. There are roadblocks, there are things. It's harder than I thought. <laughs> Real, and, reality sets it, in. Reality sets in. And uh, my biggest learning over the last 25 years, over the last 50 years is that that just happens. Like that is a fact of life. That's part of the story. That's mm -hmm. part of the journey. And in fact, climbing out that dark swamp of despair, that is the thing. Like that is the skill. That yeah. makes the difference between succeeding and not. Yeah, and it's the persistence. You know, for me, I, I remember, I mean, with XPRIZE, launched it in, came up with the idea in 94, launched it in 96, and uh, then you've got the Columbia accident. You've got, you know, uh, two, you know 2000, you know, meltdown in 2001. Yeah. And, you and stuck people, with it. And people you, you were, stuck with yeah, it. People literally call me saying, give up. Yeah. It's never going to happen. Yeah. You're never going to get it funded. Uh, my other, my Zero G Corporation. Have you flown with us? In, with no, us? I haven't. I oh have. my God, yeah, you yeah, and Larry yeah. have to come yeah, and yeah. fly. But I yeah, remember- Yeah, Howard has done it multiple times. Yeah, he, he, he's enjoyed it. I, we, I remember coming up with the business model and being so naive. Yeah, of course. So naive about what it cost to yeah, operate yeah. 727s and do this and get through the FAA on this. And of course, my, my favorite example was going into the FAA uh, so confident uh, with all my engineering done that we were going to be able to fly because NASA has been flying people in flying people in weightless parabolic flights and the the associate administrators who I had in the room look at me and go you can't do this it <laughs> it, it it doesn't allow this you're not allowed to take people well, out well, of their seatbelts okay but Peter you have the naysayer gene built into you yes when people tell you that it makes you want to do it even oh, more I, I told i said listen you're either going to retire or die before i give up <laughs> right well so yeah. uh entrepreneurs who have been successful have automatically made it through this but if you want to bring new entrepreneurs in and, and they're young yeah uh, or they haven't experienced this yet to teach them that this is going to happen is eye-opening because they so often hear stories of up and to the right where there is no swamp of despair in the middle. So making people understand that that's part of it. And, yeah. and in fact, I think this is not true only of entrepreneurship. I, I, here, here on the top it says, emotional journey of creating anything great. This is the emotional journey of graduating from college, of writing a book, of doing a play, of anything that you want to do that is an important thing. And in fact, is, you don't appreciate it Unless you go through something like yeah, that, if it's ex given to you, ex exactly. Yeah. So I, I really, I really end on this, and and the, the only thing I add to that is this try again, which was a great lesson I learned from Reed Hoffman. So I'm at a lean startup conference, and Reed Hoffman is presenting, and he talks about how LinkedIn was his third social network. Hmm. He had I, two failed social that. networks before that. I didn't know that either, hmm. and each one he learned something that made him want to try again. And he was willing to try again because he felt, oh, now I know how to do this a little bit better. Mm. So if you fail at something and you don't learn anything new and you don't know a new way to do it, I don't recommend trying again. <laughs> but if you failed at something and you learned something and you say, ah. I... So for example, uh, the Z.com, which we learned our mistake of being too early. If I had known that back in 2004, 2005, I could have tried again. Yeah. It's not appropriate to try again now. It's too late. But this lesson I took away 
to think of each of these things as at bats, mm -hmm. where mm -hmm. you go at bat. If a baseball player goes up at bat and they strike out, they don't give up. They don't never play baseball again. They look at the tape. They ask their uh, their coach about what was that last pitch? What did I miss about the signal? What did I do? Was my swing too? And and you go up at bat again. You go try yeah. again. Uh, and um, the idea of taking a company even that had failed and doing that same idea again, but with new knowledge didn't really resonate with me until I heard Reed Hoffman say it. And, and now I really even feel yeah. that. Is, is, I've done that uh, twice before, uh, one with International Space University, then Singularity University, and learning from the first business model failure and creating it again, and then with uh, human longevity and fountain life. How about yourself? Have you, yeah. have you done that? Uh, yeah, so, so I, I did um, different solar companies that I learned from, different storage companies that I learned from. And again, sometimes you missed the timing and now it's too late to try it again. But sometimes you learn something and now the timing is right. So well, one example, I did an energy storage company in 2013 <clears throat> that didn't work out, but that's because solar energy wasn't cheaper than fossil fuel at that time. Mm. So it, I knew it was gonna ha happen, but now 10 years later, 2013, 2023, now all of a sudden, PV prices came down, not by my doing, <laughs> by, by China's doing, by Germany investing in subsidies and other things happened in the world that I couldn't make happen. I was hoping they would happen. They took 10 years. Like you said, everything takes 10 years. It took 10 years for PV prices to come down to be competitive with fossil fuels. But that, that happened as an externality that now makes going back and focusing on storage valuable. Amazing. You know, uh, Bill, to, to, to close us out here, um, uh, I typically say, you know, entrepreneurship is is the greatest joy. It is, I, I love it. I love the art of starting a company. You know, I'm on 27th now, not under 50, <laughs> but. Um, That's incredible, 27th. But, but, yeah, anyway, it's, 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 it's joyful. Yeah. Um, uh, you know, what are your, your thoughts to the entrepreneur who's uh, on the verge of taking that taking that risk? Well, I would say, it's one of the most rewarding things of all time. It's a great thing for personal growth. It's a great thing for bonding with other people. My, my children were in the school play in high school. I never was. Mm -hmm. And I saw the bonding and camaraderie that they had working on something together and the celebration they had when the play was done. And, and I thought, God, I really missed out on that life. And I realized, no, I didn't. I did it with entrepreneurship. Yes. I, 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 make, I make my own way of, of having celebration with a team. So it's a wonderful way to bond with other people, change the world, make the world a better place. And I would say over the course of my career, it's gotten easier in the sense that people understand entrepreneurship. There's way more investors available to do this now. There's way more openness. Entrepreneurship is celebrated in a way that it wasn't. When I graduated from college, I was hiring some people after I graduated from Caltech. I had to take their parents to dinner to convince them I wasn't some pariah because they had offers at JPL and aerospace companies. And here I was getting them to come to a little startup. Like, what are you doing to my child? Yeah. Uh, um, uh, but now that, that doesn't happen and, anymore. And, and I think, you know, we're around the same age for when we were in high school into college, you know, it was Wall Street, which oh, yeah. was the, yeah, yeah. The, the place to be. Yeah, it, you would graduate, you go get a safe job at a big business. Yeah. And the, the idea now, the other th thing that's really great for entrepreneurship especially in the United States and especially in California, but everywhere in the United States, is people who have a failure, that can almost be a badge of honor. And it's, it's, you've it, learned. It, yes. Yeah. So I think there are some cultures that don't, that, that treat it a little bit more like a scarlet letter as opposed to a bar, yeah. badge of honor. But here, if you've learned something from your entrepreneurship, you can go do anything still, even if it doesn't work out. So the combination of the impact it can have, the camaraderie, the, the joy, the learning, and then the upside, of course, the upside is pretty incredible too. I mean, having an ownership stake in a company, uh, I, I said it before, but I'll say it again. It unlocks human potential. If you ever got into a business where the owner is behind the counter or a hired hand is behind the counter, you know the difference about when someone feels exactly. like they're an owner, yeah. about how great the service can be, about how, how powerful the, the feeling of ownership is. So I love the idea of giving people significant ownership in a company and seeing what happens. It's really exciting. Bill, thank you for all that you've done. Thank you for oh. sharing your lessons from the heart, uh, your wisdom. Oh, thank uh, grateful you. For you. I'm, I'm honored to be able to do it. And I, you can tell I, I totally believe in this and I, I, I hope this can, can help other people be successful. I know it can. Um, check out Bill on the web, just Google Bill Gross and the lessons you have. You've been putting out amazing content. Um, idealab.com. Yep. 
Uh, any place else that we should send just, folks? Just, just there and at YouTube, you'll, you'll see it, everything. Awesome. Great. Thank you, Bill. All right, thanks. Thanks.